So how can a Palo Alto Networks Next Generation Firewall protect the users in the network? In this video, I will show you. If this is your first time here, I'm Lars von Consigas. We call ourselves the Palo Alto Networks Experts because the Next Generation Firewall is our passion. It's what we do all day every day, migrating firewalls, providing managed services and most important, implementing security best practices. When I started to work with this box in 2010, barely anyone knew about Palo Alto Networks. But as an engineer I felt that this solution will change the world of cybersecurity. And yes, today we know it did big time, because it's one of the few security solutions that can truly secure your network. However, there's a caveat. You need to set it up in the right way in order to be effective. Because while it's awesome, it's not a magic box. So over the years we became a professional service partner for Palo Alto Networks, as well as one of a few elite authorized training centers. And was working in the field for so many years and being a trainer, I would like to share my experience with you. So over the next couple of weeks and months, we release new videos and core concepts explaining the fundamental workings of the next generation firewall, starting with the trend landscape, then deployment methods, NAT, AppID, SSL decryption, VPNs, and many more. So follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube or Twitter to stay up to date. But now let's have a look how to protect the users in your network. The first thing what we need to recognize is there isn't just one thing. Just you know, one thing we do and then magically we protect the entire network, right? Um, security protection always comes from different measurements, right? Simply because um, you know, individual to prevention techniques like IPS systems, URL filtering, antivirus, you name it, right? All of them on their own are not effective because all of them can be evaded, right? It's always just the combination uh, that is effective. And that's exactly what I would like to show you here now, okay? So taking our example, the first step was that the user tried to access a news web page which included advertisement. Here, the first thing what we can do, what I would definitely recommend is block the advertisement, right? The advertisement is nothing which really, you know, adds much value um, to your employees. So let's just block it. now. Very easily for me to say this, you know, if I obviously talk to your marketing department, they're going to tell you, no, 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 I want to get access to web advertisement because it's my job, okay? So, and here we kind of already run into the first challenge, right? When we, when we implement trap prevention techniques, right, in a lot of cases we can only do this if we have a firewall where we can effectively also define exceptions, okay? Um, so, and like in this example, that we can block advertisement to everyone in the company but allow it to specific users or groups of users like the marketing and department okay so that's really important um, to consider as well now the advertisement um, it's something kind of interesting what we you know need to understand why is it so kind of so interesting for hackers like you know put yourself into the shoes of a hacker and uh, let's say you would like to distribute your malware okay let's say you you want to earn money with ransomware for instance okay um, if you want to do this by users accessing web page, it means that you first have to hack a lot of web pages and then place your code onto this. Now that's a lot of work. Okay. On the other side, you know, if you use an advertisement network, you can just create your malware, like a malicious flash file, for instance, right? And then you just give it to the advertisement companies, and they then for you distribute this to kind of thousands of web pages worldwide. Perfect. You know, hackers heaven. Very good. Now, obviously, the risk to get caught is a little bit higher, right? But there actually, there have been cases where users got infected uh, through advertisement inside of, of, of YouTube videos, right? So even big companies like Google, who are certainly, you know, ones of the kind of better ones when it comes to security protections, are not fight against this, right? So again, that's, you know, what advertisement you always uh, should, should be careful about. Now, in the next step, there was the download of a malicious flash file. So here, you know, if we know from where the, uh, the malicious flash file came and we already know identified this URL as a malicious URL, then we could have blocked this malicious URL, you know? And of these files, usually they get delivered from other URLs, not, let's say, the news web page itself, right? So that's the web page linking to another web page. And this other web page is then effectively what we can block if we already know it to be bad. Okay, so then also the exploit code itself, right? If we know it already, then part of the IPS system, we can also then block the exploit code. Now, the problem with this is <coughs> the same one, like I said before, with antivirus, right? Because for the bad URLs, we block it if we know it. For the IPS, we block it if we know it, right? So we only block the already the known threats, right? Um, that's something what we definitely should do, but 
you know, there's a limit to this, right? What about the stuff what we don't know? And for this, we have wildfire. Okay, so what, what wildfire does is basically trying to detect the malware based on its behavior, right? So what you do is, um, let's say here we have uh, the internet, okay, kind of here connecting to your firewall, and then here on the inside we have kind of the internal network, okay? So um, now if there's a file traversing the firewall, right, this file will now be uploaded to Wildfire and a Wildfire will do an analysis on this file and it will effectively kind of look at its behavior, right? Um, so instead of just checking a signature like antivirus, it's in a looking at the behavior. So like the same way like you would open a PDF file on your PC, Wildfire would open it up um, and it kind of check what is it doing. And if it sees, well, it's just a PDF, well then that's fine. But if it sees, okay, it's trying to uh, change registry values. Uh, it tries to can inject code in other processes and tries to access the internet. So it kind of shows a combination of, of behaviors which are clearly uh, malicious, then it identifies this to be malicious, creates a signature, which it then delivers down um, to the firewall. And it does this in just five minutes. Okay, and an important thing to notice here is the, the wildfire signatures, which you're downloading every five minutes, don't only, not only include the signatures of the files you uploaded, but for every Palo Alto Networks customer worldwide. Meaning, you know, if there was a threat seen anywhere else in the world just five minutes earlier, right, then you would already be protected against it, which is, I think, really effective. Okay, now, um, a problem often here, or a concern what always arises is that obviously we're uploading data to the cloud. And especially over here in Europe, um, this is always a concern. Now, the important thing is here, we need to understand what is exactly happening, right? And um, the big risk really comes from files like Flash, executables, uh, Java, and maybe Android APK files, okay? Now these files, as long as you're not a software development company, they don't include private details, right? So nobody should have any concerns whatsoever uploading these files uh, to the cloud, okay? Um, so, but then also, let's say private related files, like PDF files and Office files, yes, they include private details and you might not want to upload to them to the cloud. Okay, so here, you know, every company for itself needs to check kind of uh, legal things. But again, what you need to consider is that you can define a very grain policy where you can say, right, I only want to upload, for instance, um, files which are publicly down accessible on the internet. Right. So, you know, any files just downloaded from, from the internet, which don't use SSL, for instance, right, them, them I want to upload. Um, so with this, you know, again, with these policies, you can do uh, uh, quite a lot of details there, right? So just, you know, it's not just a yes or no, right? Looking in the detail here really makes sense because, um, you know, this will give you a significant level of, of, of additional protection, okay? Um, lastly, there are also your links, right? So if there's SMTP or POP3 traffic traversing the firewall, then the firewall looks inside of these uh, emails and then takes up the links, sends the links to Wildfire, and the Wildfire will also analyze the links. And if it identifies there that, you know, by accessing a link, a malicious uh, file was downloaded, it will then also classify this and also generate signatures for this, okay? So it's also something uh, which is very effective, okay? On this one, by the way, don't worry about, you know, Wildfire clicking on accept messages and stuff like this, so they have intelligence in there to kind of overcome these, uh, these things as well, okay? Now, uh, beside the cloud-based infrastructure for Wildfire, there's also an, an, an on-site solution, which is called the WL500, right? So it's, it's very similar to the cloud, but what we do need to recognize is that uh, kind of what a box, an appliance on-site can do, it will never be the same what the cloud can do, right? There's always more what you can do in the cloud, meaning the WL500 from a functionality point of view is always behind the cloud. That's why actually it also kind of makes sense to deploy this in kind of a in hybrid mode where you, for instance, say, right, privacy files, PDFs, Word documents are sent to the local WL500 while not privacy related files like executables are still sent up to the public cloud, right? So these kind of hybrid uh, setups are also, are also supported. The important thing what we have to realize about Wildfire is that Wildfire is not just a sandbox, like what I just explained to you, right? Wildfire really is a threat intelligence cloud. Why? Because um, it really correlates different indicators of compromise and then distributes them throughout the kind of the different uh, threat prevention solutions, right? So for instance, um, there's a malicious file downloaded, 
right? Um, with the sandbox, we identify it's malicious, and we create then obviously the uh, the AV signature. Okay, so that's what we kind of just talked about. But then we already the firewall also knows from where, from what URL was this file downloaded. Okay, so obviously this download URL is malicious as well, meaning we can straight away also update, update the URL filtering solution, right? Um, by running the file, we might see that it tries to you know, connect to certain uh, command and control uh, IP addresses and tries to resolve them via DNS. So here we can also then update uh, DNS signatures. And where we see other types of kind of command and control traffic, where we can then upgrade the uh, IPS system with different command and control signatures, right? So. This is really important, right? Because if you compare this with most other firewall vendors, um, they often just buy in uh, databases for your F filtering or AV or whatever from other vendors, which are kind of separate, right? So it is not integrated, okay? Um, and this really is a big limitation because um, here what, what, what always is key from a security prevention these days is the wind kind of lowering the, wind, the window of opportunity for the hacker. Right, so the hacker launches kind of his malware campaign. Right, we identify the threat, and straight away we need to update all of the different systems what we have with these indicators of compromise. That when we see malicious activity, that we cannot block this uh, st uh, straight away. Okay, so that's really what uh, what wildfire is, is all about. Okay, now there's a downside of this, right? Because you know, processing this in five minutes and sometimes less is very powerful. It's very quick. Right? But still, it takes five minutes. And the firewall, the next generation firewall, is a device which was built to handle a high volume of traffic at low latency. Right, So it cannot really buffer anything uh, for five minutes. And neither would kind of the protocol support it. Right? So the firewall isn't something like um, uh, an email server which can you know, store and quarantine um, emails or files. Okay, So that, this, this means that if there is a file traversing the firewall, which it the antivirus signatures don't know yet, you know, it will be uploaded to Wildfire, but at the same time, it will be passed through to the end user, okay? Now, the difference is that after five minutes, you will get a report, right, a Wildfire analysis report, which tells you, hey, listen, you know, we have seen a file traversing a network, which we believe is bad, right? And the important thing here is, Palo Alto Networks is not just saying, hey, listen, you know, this is bad, and you have to believe us. They also tell you why they believe it is bad, right? So like in this case, you know, we can see Belarus, you know, simulated some uh, mouse and keyboard events or connected to unregistered domain names, right? And again, the combination of these events, you know, suggests that this is, this is malicious. And obviously, this is, you know, a big thing, right? Because, you know, getting alerted about an event like this happening um, after five minutes versus getting to know two months afterwards, for instance, um, that you got infiltrated, that obviously makes a big difference, okay? Good, okay. So, um, following on with our attack, so where there was a download, the download, there flash file, and now there was the exploit on the end user device. Now, this is something which happens on the end user device, so there's nothing what we can do about this on the firewall, okay? That's also something what Palo Alto Networks recognized, where I said, okay, right, there's a lot of things, a lot of good and effective things what we can do on the network, but certain things you can only do something about on the endpoint itself. And that's why they said, okay, what we also need, if we want to protect enterprises from a security point of view, right, we need to also uh, have a look at the endpoint itself. And that's kind of where they came up with the kind of next generation endpoint security solution called TRAPS. Now, obviously, here we're going to focus on the firewall. Still, I just want to show you very quickly uh, what TRAPS is doing because it actually also provides a lot of value to the firewall. Why? I'm going to show you in a moment. Okay. Now, um, let's look at these exploits on the end user device. Okay. Um, the first thing what we need to, to recognize is that um, in order for an exploit to work, a hacker always need to use exploit techniques. And exploit techniques, you can see like a toolkit, okay? Like an electrician needs a screwdriver and a voltmeter or something like this, okay? So like like this, you know, hackers also need need tools, okay? And these are kind of exploit techniques. Like for instance, the buffer overflow, right? The buffer overflow meaning, you know, when you, let's say you launch a program like in an explorer, it will always reserve a specific area memory, right? And a buffer overflow would mean that it now tries to access an area memory which did not previously reserve, okay? So that's kind of just one example of, a, of an exploit technique, okay? Now, these exploit techniques, they're important because um, if we think at, you know, how can we prevent these exploits, okay? First of all, you know, 
uh, as long as we can have software, we can have software box, right, which can be exploited. Okay, so this is something which is never going to go away, and neither will we ever be able to know all of the bugs of software before a hacker will know them. Okay, just not realistic. At the same time, the exploitation code, what the hacker sends kind of to the device to exploit the vulnerability, right, of the, they are kind of also in the thousands or millions. Right, so this is also something where you know, like with malware, we, we cannot really always cope up, we cannot cope up with this. Okay, so that's something we cannot know beforehand. What we can know beforehand, however, are these exploit techniques because there are only about 20 to 25 out there, right? Um, and only kind of one or two get developed every year, right? So that's something where we can, where we can cope with. Okay, so how would this work? So let's say we have the exploit on the endpoint. Um, and let's say the flash file is loaded by uh, Internet Explorer, right? The hacker would now try to do a memory corruption, right? All of these exploits are always related to some extent to something, some manipulation of memory, simply because what the hacker at the end of the day tries to do is he delivers a data file. Remember, you know, a flash file, PDF file, so pure data file, uh, which includes kind of some instructions. And he will basically wants to get an existing piece of software, like for Internet Explorer, to run and execute its commands, right? That's always kind of the, the objective uh, behind an exploit, okay? So how the hacker is doing this is, and this is not just one example, for instance, he's doing, doing, doing a heap spray where he kind of reserves different area and memory where he places his malicious code. Then he triggers the buffer overflow, which is now the kind of benign software or Internet Explorer is accessing an, an area memory, which did not previously reserved, right? And which is effectively is loading the code of the hacker. And our Internet Explorer is executing the commands of the hacker. Okay? So now, all of this is now highly simplified, how I kind of show it to you here. Kind of uh, when we really look at memory operations, this is way more complex, right? But I just kind of want to give you an overview here, right? Because now, if we kind of apply traps to this, what traps simply is doing, it's trapping, right, these uh, exploit techniques, right? So it's, it's stopping the heap spray, right? Or it's stopping the buffer overflow. Right? And this is obviously very effective because we don't care what is the software bug, we don't care what is the exploit code, right? You know, this can be completely new zero day attack, nobody knows about it, and traps blocks it. Okay, so it's just a really effective method. And again, these exploit prevention, by the way, is only kind of one element of traps, right? Traps like the firewall has the same approach of basically integrating a lot of different trap prevention techniques, right? Uh, which kind of makes the, the entire solution secure. Okay, so now the reason I explained this to you is obviously traps is a dedicated product, has nothing to do with the firewall, right? But and that's important, it is part of Palo Alto Network security platform, meaning traps, right, will also send data to the cloud, right? So for instance, if there's any customer around the world having traps, right, identifying kind of a new zero day malware, right, traps will send this to the cloud, Wildfire will know it, Wildfire will deliver protections then again also to the firewall, right? Meaning, you know, it's important for you to know because the protections, Right, what you receive are also originating um, from these endpoint protection solutions, making your firewall also more secure. And by the way, obviously, it also works the other way around, right? So if a firewall detects something, you know, it can send this to the cloud, and the cloud delivers down to traps as well. Okay, so um, good. Now, following on with our attack, the next thing was uh, that the based on the export, the user now went to a malicious web page. Um, uh, without the user's knowledge, okay? So here what we can do is block malicious or even better, unknown URLs, okay? So remember what I explained to you before and with, uh, with Wildfire, right? Updating different uh, solutions, including the URL filtering. So here this now kind of makes a completely different uh, case because now the possibility that Palo Alto Networks already knows about this malicious URL, right? Uh, with the integration of Wildfire is, is, is very high. Okay, so with this, you know, blocking malicious URLs, very effective, okay? Even more effective is also to kind of actually to block unknown URLs, okay? That's something that we found to be extremely effective because, you know, no, no matter how good Wildfire and Palo Networks is in detecting kind of uh, new malicious URLs, right? And um, it's just, you know, by, by definition, never ever will they be able to know everything, okay? So, but if they know enough, to kind of allow all of the good stuff, then we can easily block the unknown URLs, 
okay so and this is again is very effective something uh, often people are afraid of because oh it could block you know a lot a lot of kind of uh, good applications but you know it's something which you can analyze easily right and i can tell you i've implemented this with a lot of kind of also, also big customers with kind of three and a half thousand uh, users and more uh, behind their firewall and it's working very well because Polar networks also has become really good and actually detecting kind of new urls and um, was kind of a funny case with um was the a banking customer and in the IT department there were some people making fun out of it um, to kind of try to find new porn web pages on Google um, and you know which which the firewall doesn't know yet right and uh, actually they found out that uh, this kind of pan DB from Palo Alto Networks actually was pretty good and pretty fast uh, kind of identifying these 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 unknown URLs okay so that's something just from from experience I can tell you works pretty well okay now Next action was that there was the download of a malicious executable. Okay, so here the first thing what we need to do is SSL decryption. Okay, SSL decryption really is one centerpiece of of your firewall configuration. Something which unfortunately I often see not being configured. Right um, now, if you look at often these kind of firewall comparisons, right? These firewall test companies that tell you, oh, you know, you know, we tested five thousand different evasion techniques uh, for the IPS system or whatever, right? <laughs> but the evasion technique what hackers use all the time, they don't test. This is SSL. Right, so a lot of kind of attacks these days, or most to be honest, they use SSL for the very same reason we use SSL, right? So that we can basically protect our data, right? And the, the hacker does the same thing, he doesn't want to get caught, so he kind of uh, just uses SSL to uh, hide uh, his data, right? So again, SSL decryption very essential because once we decrypt the SSL traffic, um, we can look inside of it and, for instance, identify uh, the download of the executable file and block it. Okay, so here file blocking and blocking the down of executables is extremely effective simply because, you know, by far, not all, but by far the majority of attacks do depend on the download of an executable file. For the same, same reason what I can explain to you earlier, um, that, you know, just with an exploit, you just often the hacker misses functionality. Okay, so that's why this is just really effective. Um, now, at the same time, you might think, okay, but I cannot just block all the download of executables. You're right, you cannot. But what you can do with uh, the, your security policy is basically define a rule where you allow the download of executables from trusted sources. So often what we see here, what we use there are kind of update applications, so Google update, Firefox update, and, and, and things like this, right? Um, and then, you know, block the download of executables from everywhere else. And that's really effective because, you know, we don't care if this executable is good or bad, right? We simply block it. And with this, you know, it works, okay? And then, again, defining the um, uh, kind of the, the exceptions then, then works quite well. Good. So then, obviously, if the uh, malware was already known by Wildfire, right, and this can be blocked in there as well by the antivirus, um, obviously, getting updated every five minutes here certainly helps and is a big advantage compared to kind of normal antivirus products, which just update every 24 to 48 hours, right? Um, so, and now we are kind of, again, at this kind of half um, half stage where we have now a malware infected PC inside of our network. And again, you know, the example what I showed you now, the infection was just one example of an infection, right? Uh, you can have situation where an already infected PC comes into your network, right? And obviously you want to kind of cope for these uh, situations as well, okay? So now, so we have this kind of setup. Um, the first thing what you probably want to do is actually get rid of your proxy. Right, so a lot of companies when we implement the next generation firewall, they still have kind of an old URL filtering proxy uh, implemented, and it's often a bit of a kind of controversy of should I keep the proxy or or not? Okay, and um, often there's an argument where they say, yeah, but you know, yes, the next generation firewall is really good, but you know, next generation firewall plus proxy is definitely more secure than next generation firewall on its own, and yes, this is true right um but when it comes to security you always need to consider really um uh your constraints right you kind know, of you cannot implement all security products in the world in the network right you always have a constraint of money and time right because it always takes money and time to to manage these things so and um if you kind of take the effectiveness of proxy plus firewall 
right? Uh, and take into account the extra money and time you need to to operate this, right? Then it's not an effective solution, right? If you, for instance, just take this money and invest it, or money and time and invest this into, for instance, advanced endpoint protection like traps, then you know you boost your your security protection way higher, and you're much more of a kind of a much more effective security operation, right? So that's why you know. I always recommend get rid of the proxy because it often also kind of causes you or kind of gives you a lag of visibility on the firewall, right? So it's definitely the, the, the better approach, okay? So then coming back to our attack, right? Remember the first challenge what the hacker had is that uh, the modern factory PC needs to know the IP address of its command and control server, right? So the first thing what it tried to do was kind of sending this DNS query to, um, to resolve this kind of uh, command and control domain. Right? So here in our Palo Alto networks, um, this wildfire also identifies um, malicious DNS queries for kind of known command and control uh, domains. Okay, so these are kind of then blocked by an antivirus, and that's good, right? Because you know blocks the communication. Um, the problem with what you have is that in most cases the DNS server is inside of the network, right? Meaning the packet what you receive on the firewall comes from the IP address of the proxy. Right, but knowing this chain, we know now that you know it's not the DNS server who's infected with this malware; it's a PC behind the DNS server, right? So, and we obviously, you know, the the attack or the kind of the, um, the 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 infection is kind of contained, so that's good. But we still would like to know who is this guy because we definitely want to get him get 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 him out of the network, okay? That's why there's an additional feature, which is called a DNS sync call. And with the DNS sync call, we also, we're not just blocking the DNS request, we're also sending back a fake response, right? With kind of a fake IP address, like this one, 223, 245, 245, 223, right? So an IP address, which is not known anywhere in your network. So with this now, the malware gonna try to connect to this IP address, which we obviously block on the firewall, but now we know, right, who access, tries to access this IP address must be one whom we kind of send such a response to, and with this we can then identify um, these malware infected PCs, okay? So it's kind of something pretty small, but sometimes pretty clever as well, right, and really helpful, because what we have seen is that kind of these suspicious DNS queries, they are one of the kind of key indicators of a compromise, which kind of help us to identify machines inside of the network, uh, which are infected with malware. Okay, good. So now, the next action, you know, again, command and control traffic. Here also the anti-spyware system can block uh, known command and control traffic. Um, another effective measurement as well as app ID. Okay, remember when I explained app ID, I said, that, you know, any type of communication which goes over the network uh, is identified by Palo Alto Networks as an application. Obviously, they don't know everything, and often, especially here, these kind of command and control traffics actually come up as an unknown application, right? Now, um, you have seen the database, it's pretty big uh, in there, right? So this means, uh, with this, what we can do is we can define what do we want to allow. And with this, we can block everything else, including the unknown, right? So this, again, is a very effective measurement to reduce the attack surface, right? And with this, kind of secure our network. Now, and to be honest, unknown applications for command and control traffic, that's something kind of five years ago, we have seen it a lot, okay? In recent years, uh, it's kind of getting less and less because more command and control traffic is just web-based, okay? So there we don't see this much anymore, but it's still uh, kind of a recommended uh, and a good, a good measurement, okay? So now, now let's assume, um, you know, we have a malware infected PC on, on the network, and this one now has successfully established the command and control traffic, okay? So now you're in trouble. Well, certainly you're in trouble if your network looks like this, right? So if your data center, where effectively, you know, your chrome jewels, your valuable IT information are, are stored, is connected to internal network, and internal users can communicate directly to it, then you're in trouble, right? Because now the malware infected PC gets at your data center, right? That's why uh, one very important measurement as well, you need to think about the zero trust architecture, right? Basically network segmentation uh, to segment off, uh, especially your users. Now part of zero trust is really, you know, more like, you know, north, south, east, west segregation in the data center, creating different zones, right? But at the minimum, what you should think about is separate off your users from your data center, from your servers, okay? So that's kind of the minimum what you need to do um, because, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, even if you kind of look at the kind of the biggie, uh, big attacks, what do you see in the news, it's usually, in most cases, first uh, a device, right, 
an end user device was infected with malware from where they then went from when then the hacker kind of made their way into the data center. Okay, so network segmentation um, is a very important measurement as well. And by the way, if you're interested in security best practices for Palo Alto Networks, then check out the blog on our webpage. Here in the best practice section, you can download this worksheet with over 120 best practices for the next generation firewall. And very soon, we will also launch a security best practice training with a lot of videos explaining all of these security best practices in detail. So if you're interested, then sign up to our mailing list and we will let you know as soon as this free training is available.